Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech in Honolulu, and uh, I'm I'm joining the show by remote. The show is Energy in America, and uh, we're talking with Lou Pugliarici in Washington. He's the president of EPRINC, which is the Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington. Thank you so much again for joining us, Lou. It's always nice to talk to you. It's great to be here, Jay. You know, we, uh, we, we talked uh, a number of times about the effect of coronavirus on the economy and thus on the oil and gas markets. Right. And it is, get, it is getting worse. Uh, and today is a, a kind of a benchmark day. Today we found that um, it's airborne, not only airborne, um, but you, you, you don't have to have any symptoms. This may explain why it's so fantastically uh, contagious. You can go through the whole process of the disease, not even know it, and infect a whole number of people while that happens. Furthermore, I just read a minute ago, here's a new one for you. Um, it only takes one virus particle, called a variant, one virus particle to infect you. One microscopic particle will do the job. And this, this begins, you know, the, 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 the power of this virus, is we, we're just learning about it, and so it's likely to infect the whole world. Uh, well, so I, the U.S. has its problems today, but before you know it, they'll be everywhere in all the continents. And if we don't watch out, they'll come back on us even after we've, we've flattened the curve. Um, so my, my great concern is this is going to be a long-term thing. Now, you can disagree with me, but you won't have much, much luck in persuading me about that. Luke. No, Sorry. no, I, I think it's a, it's a big problem. It's a formidable problem. I do think I was, I thought very interesting. If you get a chance to watch the interview of the chief Korean doctor, who managed very successfully the, Korea, the South Korean program to uh, you know, virtually uh, eliminate new cases in, in South Korea. And during the interview, he said they had, uh, uh, you know, look at the whole distribution of deaths. They had one death of a 40-year-old and one death of a 30-year-old and no deaths below 30. So I do think this issue of cold morbidity is a big deal. I think we have a huge measurement problem, not just discovering who has it, who doesn't, but also understanding what people are actually dying of. Is someone, is someone dying with coronavirus? Is someone dying because of coronavirus? And there is no consistency in how this data is recorded worldwide. So I think we have that problem. Um, Actually, I think the, the issue of reinfection, it's possible, I guess, it's possible, but um, I would suggest that the available scientific research points to that being a relatively low probability, and the cases of reinfection might really be initial measurement error, but, you know, I think we have to keep that in mind. But the global data from uh, CDC and a lot of folks suggest that 80% of the people who get the disease will not be hospitalized. And if we can do something to drop that number of hospitalizations, say from 20 to 15 or 10, through ways to boost folks' immunities and things until we get uh, a good vaccine, uh, I, 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 that could go a long way. But I do think we don't really have a good story why the death rate is varying so much. Part of that has to be the healthcare capacity, but there are other issues out there. I think one of the interesting phenomenon on that point is the is the experience in Louisiana. In Louisiana, they elected to have the Mardi Gras, and uh, it wasn't uh, two weeks after that that the, the infection rate went way, way up. The That's Mardi Gras, of course, is everybody is close together. Yeah, that probably was a bad idea. Yeah. So I mean, it's got it's got a lot to do with how many how many crowds you're with, and how yeah. close you are to people, and uh, they're breathing on you. But I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. I mean, such as the airborne issue, such as the fact that it, it doesn't take repeated contact. Only one contact is necessary. It doesn't take a whole lot of. Uh, particles no, to affect I, you. I, I, Only one particle is necessary. I so we don't we don't really understand just exactly what makes it so contagious. The uh, fact is that it's very contagious and it's going to continue to be very contagious. And and New York may be a place where everybody's uh, you know brushing brushing shoulders, yeah. you know, rubbing shoulders and they're 
and they've, they've had a lot of personal contact and maybe like Louisiana, that's why New York is a, is a hot spot. It could be that people in New York, you know, don't like to follow the rules too. And for a week or two, they weren't. And, and then you, and then you have the result. Well, but all in all, I think the U.S. is in much worse shape than Korea was. Uh, Korea, you know, handled it very, very carefully, uh, with, with, um, with, with great care and concern and uh, better than we did. Uh, we, we sort of blew it there for the first, uh, two, three, four weeks. Uh, Korea did not do that. They saw what happened in China and, and their concern was translated into very diligent effort and, and they succeeded. So I have two points on that. One is I think CDC did blow the testing. They wanted to have their own test. They were worried about whether they have accurate sensitivity. And they should have let the private labs just run with the test right away. The testing was important. I also think uh, there seems to be something to this dosage level. So, by the way, you can get a cold from a single virus. It's not, uh, it does seem to be more contagious than than influenza and the common cold, but uh, it's not unusual for a single virus to do this. Um, I, I do, but, you know, let's, uh, uh, and, and tomorrow, actually, uh, Eprink's newsletter will go out with uh, links to all our recent publications. And in it, uh, in that newsletter, uh, Larry Goldstein, the uh, previous president of Eprink and myself, have a, an unusual, thing for us. We're going to give a commentary on this. And uh, our commentary is that uh, we're both kind of uh, plenty long in the tooth. Larry himself has a very impaired immune system. But we think for the sake of the country, we need to have a plan on how we're going to restart the economy. We need to give the American people an idea how we're going to get what the end game looks like. And I'm pretty open to a lot of different strategies for that. But I don't think we can just keep saying, well, just hang on for a few more weeks. We have to have a plan. Oh, I uh, certainly totally agree with we gotta have a plan. And, and the first part of the plan, you know, is to is stop losing people. Um, I mean, losing them to the disease and, and to be killed by the disease. And, and the big way to do that, let me say, and, and I, I, I like, again, to make you president because I think you do a really good job. Um, what we need is testing. You know, there was testing. talk about a 15-minute test. We if we knew more. what the problem was, and these, these, right. these uh, people who spread, you know, or asymptomatic spreaders, right. if we could identify who those people are, you know, we could, we could isolate them. We're not doing that because we don't think they have the disease. But if we had testing, we would know who they were. And we would do a you, much my, better job. My son is uh, operating out of Park City, Utah, and got the coronavirus. Oh, no. It, actually, for a few days, he had a rough go, but he was okay. He stayed home. It took him forever to get a test. It took him forever to get a test. They, he went and got a regular test, and they couldn't get it. They couldn't get a flu test. So I had these symptoms. And eventually, they, uh, he got tested, and then he was contacted by a public health official. I mean, he's perfectly fine now because he's like 26 Good. years old, right? It didn't really take him down that. I mean, he had a rough go. He had a fever. He, he uh, was uh, pretty sick, but he's, he's fine now. So Good. what I'd like to talk about a little bit today, and I'm going to, is uh, uh, what What's happening to the world uh, oil market or energy markets generally? And uh, and then I'm going to make a few comments about what's going on in China because I have some new data that just came in, some new reports. And uh, some of that is pretty hopeful if it's accurate. You know, we're always worried about Chinese data, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> um, make a few comments on that. So. The first thing I'd like to do is uh, let's look at the first picture here, which so this is what's called the benchmark uh, standard of, standard and poor's or you know uh, global flat spot crude prices. Now these are prices what we call for market crude, right? Western tech, West WTI is, is West Texas Intermediate, dated Brent is really a, a crude oil that's traded on the London market and the European markets, but they trade worldwide. But these are the prices for the so-called benchmark crews. But today, 
Western Canadian Select, because it's a long way from these uh, from these tradable markets, was at seven dollars a barrel. Uh, mixes of Mexican crude are at ten dollars a barrel. This is a colossal uh, drop in the value of crude oil. And if you think about crude oil and products, they're worth about uh, $4 trillion a year, right? I mean, direct value. And so we're talking about taking the value from $4 trillion to $1 trillion worldwide, at least on an annualized basis. I don't think we're going to stay here the whole year. And uh, that's a massive transfer from producers to consumers. And that might be kind of a, a hopeful sign if consumers could use these fuels. But as you know, uh, they're having a hard time using these fuels because of the lockdown. So why don't we go and... Uh, I'm so what you have is a double whammy. Uh, yeah, the double. cost of a, a gallon of oil, a, ga a gallon of gas at the pump must be really low now. I mean, theoretically, but also nobody's driving. So, uh, you can, know, you know oil companies are... How many yeah. times can you drive around the block, you know, if you're quiet? Right, <laughs> right. So, so you have a lot of what we call inelasticity. Now, if you look at the next picture here, this is from my uh, old colleague and friend who has been on the phone with uh, industry, uh, you know, talking to seeing industry and country analyses, talking to traders and terminal operators. And he's looking at, what is the estimate decline in world demand for petroleum products month by month by the end of April? Right? So if you look at the EIA data for January, February, March, it doesn't look that bad. But as Larry shows in this data, world demand, you figure about world consumption, is around 95 to 100 million barrels a day, right? Mm -hmm. According to that, to Larry's data, which I is which I think is spot on, world demand for petroleum, all products, jet fuel, gasoline, distillate, and ethane, a lot of petrochemical markets, is going to drop by over twenty five percent in April by the end of April. This is we have no precedent for this. We, we, I, I don't care. You can look at. The history of the modern oil market, going back to the Arab oil embargo, there is nothing, nothing that looks like this. And so this is going to, you know, we already have some, uh, I think Whiting Petroleum declared bankruptcy today. A lot of the independent producers are going to be in big, big trouble in the next few months. <clears throat> so how does that actually tr trickle out there? So, okay, if I'm a, an oil producer or a distributor, and I have no business, or I'm underwater in terms of income and expense, uh, you know, then I, I stop doing business. I have to stop doing business, and maybe I go bankrupt. And that, in turn, affects the supply, the supply, you know, the, the supply line. <clears throat> so even though right now I'm going to be paying less for cheap oil, um, as we go forward, there won't be so much oil. And that may not be so easily reversible later. Tell me well, what you think about so those things. That's a really good question. So I think there's two parts to this. You know, it depends how long this lasts. Um, I think if we end up, and what what the new settled price is clearly, and, and one of the things I want to point out of this decline in prices, which uh, um, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, the price of oil in that first chart, you can see it's dropped from like 60 to 20. That's but probably a lot low, less than other places. And uh, a lot of folks say, well, you know, this is the Russian Saudi price war. But our own estimates suggest that that's a $40 drop. Yeah, you can fix the Russian Saudi price war. That yeah. gives you $6. This is demand destruction on a global scale because the world economy is grinding to a halt. Okay. And. That is what is so scary to me about this. The Rus you know, we would be off a few, you know, the Russians and the Saudis, they could take five, maybe eight bucks off the price of oil. They cannot take 40 bucks off the price of oil. So, um, so there's a lot of talk in Washington about, well, the president should call the Russians, or 
we should prorate our production and get get the get the markets to stabilize. No, that's not going to fix it. We have to restart the world economy. It brings stability in this market. Okay. Now, well, what about restarting the oil industry? And it seems to me no, that I think, I think you that can't you can't restart the world economy without restarting all the pieces of it. And this is an essential piece. Yeah, so if I say to you, Mr. President, that tomorrow we have to build the world economy back again, where does building oil and gas fit? So I, I, don't you, think, I don't think that's a huge problem because we have massive inventories. So if there was a hopeful sign out there, these, these supplies can come pouring out of these inventories. In fact, uh, I spoke to some refiners yesterday they have vast stocks of uh, jet fuel. They were trying to get an exemption to the Jones Act, this act that requires you to use only American tankers, so they can move supplies around different parts of the continental U.S. by boat. And so uh, we have a huge overhang of different products. And the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, we switch. We have different fuels we use in winter and summer. And I think the government has gone ahead and provided a lot of exemptions to pro provide a little more uh, flexibility into the market. Um, so how, how do you see this going? I mean, uh, again, when, how does the, you know, the resurrection of the oil and gas industry play in the resurrection of the economy in general? Should, well, it, should, be, should it be pumped up in advance? Should the no, government no, step no, in no, and try to raise it up? I or should it be an organic? And it's going to be organic. You may, you may be able to justify some uh, intervention by the Treasury Department or the Fed to provide bridge loans and things. I'm completely against an oil import fee or adding more tariffs or regulatory overburden. I think you should continue with the regulatory reform effort. You should have the capital markets operating as fluidly as possible as we start to come out of this. Um, we are going to have to do a lot of confidence building to get people back in airplanes, uh, to be able to travel back to Hawaii. And I, I do think we need to think about, we, I do think we have a younger population, which is, yeah, of course, susceptible to this virus, but much less, they see much less fatality risk than the older population. I think there are things... We can do, and we should have a plan for that, okay? Because the yes. cost, we cannot do this. And I, I think this is both sides of the aisle. Even Governor Cuomo said, look, it's not sustainable, right? I am sure in Hawaii, there must be somebody saying, this is not sustainable. We have no tourists coming to Hawaii. But you can do it for a month, it's going to be painful. You can't do it for six months. Yeah. So what about, now what about a utility? Uh, what about a utility that runs on oil, which is what we have here in large part? Um, very cheap. This is, very is very a good is a, power price. Well, yeah. Should I should I uh, you know buy futures in, uh, in in oil? Should I buy lots of reserve in oil so I <laughs> I, I can keep it coming at uh, at ten dollars a barrel? I don't think it is. I mean, if you're an investor, you should buy it hoping it'll go up to $40 a barrel, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Luke. I'm, I'm, I'm making a note of that. <laughs> but I think, actually, let me just say one of the things that you read the press, you read the, the kind of all the blogs and people we talk to, there's a lot of people out there, and this will be in our newsletter tomorrow, saying, well, this is the end of the petroleum era. It's an indication of that getting rid of fracking is not so bad and that uh, we now can rebuild the world economy on renewable fuels only. But guess what? When we come out of this, it's going to be obvious that petroleum is plentiful and it's pretty cheap. And one of the big losers of this potentially could be the grand design to transition the world economy to these fuels of the future. I suspect this is going to be a very hard road for electric vehicles and for more exotic renewable uh, programs, particularly outside the utility sector. And in Hawaii even, uh, your uh, baseload power prices are going to fall substantially, substantially. 
Mm-hmm. Your gasoline price is going to fall substantially. No, oh, good, good for that. But right. let me let me ask you the long the long term thing. You know, you're describing is that yes, we will ultimately you know have a renaissance. We'll we'll find our our economy again, right. and hopefully the, the global economy economy will recover. And uh, it might be different. I, you know, you and I can have, we'll have, we will have discussions about how it will be different <laughs> around energy, especially. But let me ask you, you know, uh, if, if it recovers and we sort of get back to normal again, or at least a semblance of normal, um, is that saying also that the price of a, of a barrel of oil will go back to where it was? Uh, I, well, I, don't know. I believe the equilibrium price for oil is not going to be in the 50 to 60 dollar range but probably in the 40 to 50 dollar range or maybe the 40 dollar range and that may seem like a small amount but actually it's a big deal and i think if the prices stay at 40 or below you know, the u.s oil production can recover i don't think it will grow substantially but we'll still be a major oil producer how about gas? We've been talking about oil for the last few minutes, but gas, I mean, you, you follow gas so closely and you've taught me a lot about gas. You've taught me the, you know, the future in many countries and many places in the world will be LNG, uh, natural gas. And so where is natural be, gas going to come out on this? I think natural gas will remain uh, well priced. However, I think we're going to see substantial reduction in this sort of what we call free gas associated gas, the gas that accompanies the production of the liquid uh, crude oil. And uh, you're going to see the dry gas producers do a little better. Um, We're we're working on a paper on this. Michael Lynch and Max Pazira are working on a paper on what what this means for the price of gas and for the Mm -hmm. supply of gas. And uh, I, I have kind of an open mind on that. I'm looking forward. Because we are proceeding with a fourth year of our joint U.S.-Japan project on the future of Asian LNG. Yeah, what about all the money that that was, uh, uh, you know, going to go into uh, building um, infrastructure for gas? You know, the ships, the pipelines, what have you. Billions going to go in, and I'm really wondering, and you must be close to this, is that going to continue or is that stopped? No, it will continue. LNG is a long time play. It may slow down a bit in certain areas. I think the interesting question is right now, major growth is China. And interesting enough, uh, if you are to believe the data out of China, and we've got a lot of data came in today, uh, it seems to be the first world economy entering the post COVID-19 era. And uh, the numbers look pretty good for what they're worth, you know, because you're, you're always worried about Chinese data, whether it's how real it is. But the, uh, you know, the producers, uh, manufacturers index, a lot of the numbers on, uh, on uh, energy demand seem to be picking up in China very quickly now. And uh, I think the Chinese are likely to use this as an opportunity to increase their storage of uh, natural gas and strategic stocks of petroleum. So that's kind of a good news, bad news for the world oil market. You know, one factor that has popped up, and it, it popped up most recently yesterday, was uh, in connection with the workers who are working on uh, essential service type industries. You know, some workers in this country are not working uh, for because they're not essential services, and, you know, they, they've either lost their jobs or been sent home, um, or, or they prefer to go home. Uh, but other workers in essential industries, like healthcare, is one. But so is Amazon. Amazon, I, I would treat as an essential industry because that's who we get all our stuff from these days. That's the reality of it. And now they're having they're having issues about uh, the safety of their uh, assembly line uh, uh, staff. Uh, it, I guess it's close proximity, a lot of people involved. Um, and they're afraid that you know people will, will catch the virus, on the, and they don't have enough protection in masks and other uh, protection equipment. So I'm really asking a long-winded question about oil and gas. So oil and gas also has a lot of labor attached to it. A lot of people are involved 
in organizing it and drilling and processing and shipping and what have you. Certainly a lot of it is automated, but there's still a lot of people involved. Has that affected the oil and gas industry yet? Do you so, think it will affect it in the future? I don't think so. I think actually we will eventually get a vaccine. We will eventually develop a herd immunity to this. I'm actually very optimistic. I, uh, I don't really believe in apocalyptic uh, uh, forecasts. Uh, they've never been right, and I don't think they're going to be right this time. This is not to suggest this isn't a hard road for a lot of people. I think that, uh, you know, all these talking heads on, I thought, you know, my suggestion, by the way, for all the network cable shows, that they should fire a third of the staff, and then we'll have a meaningful discussion about when we restart the economy. Because <laughs> if we have our people talking about all the, you know, giving their opinions where they all have a paycheck, I don't think that's a meaningful discussion. I think the executives should fire at least a third of the staff and then ask them to talk about what we do next. Well, you know, uh, I know Lou, if they put you and me in a room, uh, we wouldn't need anyone else. We would figure it out. Only, only, but the question is how, how we would implement this plan. To go back to your first comment, it's all about a plan. It's all about a rational plan. We have to good have plan, messaging. We have to, and we have to accept some risks. But frankly, the risks among the younger population are not that high. Okay. The fatality risk is very low for them. It's, uh, uh, but they're, they're fully capable of getting it, and they're fully capable of getting very sick and going down the same same road as the seniors go, and many of the fatalities have been in, you know, under 40. I understand uh, that, but that's kind of anecdotal. The global data suggests that 80% of the, of the individuals who get the coronavirus do not require hospitalization. 80%. And 20% are completely asymptomatic. Complete, they don't even know they have it. Well, and, that, and that's all true. And and that was, uh, I don't know if that was true in the Spanish flu, but uh, you're not talking about the 20% or the 10%. That's a lot of people that would die. I mean, we had all this discussion yesterday with the president of the Rose Garden about, okay, well, it's not zero. Uh, it's maybe 100,000 to 240,000. Other, other estimates are much higher. And of course, the president has, you know, in the past many times underestimated the you know, the risk of this disease. Um, so, you know, the answer is somewhere in the middle. That's a lot of people. Uh, you know, what's what's a life worth in terms of you know? We, you've often talked about squeezing. Was it squeezing the lemon? Is the squeeze worth the juice? I think that. <laughs> well, the squeeze is, is hundreds of thousands of lives. You know, well, we would prefer look, stay alive. I, I don't want to trivialize this, but um, we're not, we have millions of people who die of diseases every year around the world. Measles. Um, they will also know. continue to die. Yeah. On top of that. It's on top of that. This top of that. And, so and, I, think, I think the strategy for this is, you know, we need a strategy that addresses the contagion risk that addresses the morbidity risk and the mortality risk, right? We need such a strategy, but our ability, our ability to fight these things, whatever it is, whatever it comes up, requires a prosperous and financially sound economy. Because we're going to need resources. To do this. And if anyone thinks we can all sit around for a year waiting till we get better, till we go back to work, I think you're smoking some funny stuff because the cost of completely debilitating the U.S. economy is unacceptable. It's just I'll tell you what I would I tell you what I would do. And of course, you can try to persuade me otherwise, but I would put tons of money into medical research. I would accelerate that vaccine as fast as human possible, because I know that once people stop dying, once you can vaccinate, Okay, then the economy and the market, oil and gas included, will, will go so way high the, right away. And we'll have a huge point. recovery all around the world. I agree with you. Now, here's an interesting question. We had lots of smart, and I think there are these things you see in life, just like 9-11, right? 9-11 seemed obvious after the fact. But before, no one thought about it. And I think this is a very interesting case. 
we have literally put 80, 90% of our intellectual capital and our brain power and resources in terms of you know future issues into climate, right? Bill Gates lectured in 2015 that he was worried about infectious diseases. I saw that. That was a remarkable lecture. In 2015, California had two mobile hospitals, massive supply of, of, uh, of personal protection equipment and, and uh, medicine. They dismantled it all because of a budget crisis. Governor Cuomo, in 2016, decided not to buy $500 million worth of ventilators. Instead, he put it into the Buffalo Billions Project a solar facility which failed. So one of the things I think there needs to be a rethink of is, okay, what are the real risks facing us as a society? And are we spending the money properly? Why are we so bad at figuring out what, what the real versus the imagined risks are? And I think part of this is we have, you know, we have such an uh, inability to understand that for longer term risks, we're resourceful. We can figure this out. We should have been working on infectious diseases. We should have had a plan years ago. This is such an obvious outcome, but it's only obvious after the fact. Yeah. Well, it's true. And, and uh, you know, we, we as a democracy, sometimes we're not so smart. Uh, what I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm saying, uh, you know, it's not, it's, not so, uh, it's not so great to be great again. Uh, because what we have now is a, is a lack of priorities, just as you say. In a complex society, I mean, we live in a complex society, more complex by way of technology and the demands of so many people. Um, you really have to have careful priorities. And I mean, more, the, it, if you make a mistake on priorities, yeah. it's very costly, and we're experiencing that now. Interesting to figure what did the what did the state of Hawaii do? How do they allocate their government money? How much do they put into these exotic batteries and the uh, wave technology, all this stuff? And what do they do? How much did they put into preparing for an infectious, uh, an epidemic? You know, did someone think about whether this was possible? Probably not. Yes, and I think all of those things have to be examined closely because when we come out the other side of this, just as you say, you will have to be very close attention to the priorities I, going forward. I absolutely think we need the equivalent of a 9-11 commission on this, a bipartisan commission, to really dig into this and understand all the mistakes, including, most of all, including the failure to prepare and understand that this was a real threat. So I have one more question, Lou. You know, it's like we, we, we've had something over 60 shows. Yeah. And, and, and of those 60, I mean, about coronavirus. And yeah, of okay. those 60, a lot of, them, a lot of them started off as a show about something else. And then, you know, invariably, people's attention <laughs> went to what they really cared about. Yeah. So here we start off, you and me, it's about oil and gas, <laughs> updating the markets, looking at the prices. But invariably, we go to coronavirus. So the question I put to you, we're going to be back in two weeks. Anything could happen in two weeks. Nobody knows what will right. happen. What do you think we'll be talking about then? We're going to be talking about the plan, because in two weeks we're going to have a plan. It may be ill thought out, but we're going to have a plan to exit this, uh, this lockdown. I think there's no way, I don't care who's president, there's no way the American people will hang around their houses much longer than that without a plan. Yes, you're absolutely right. They need to see the end game. They need to see the end game. Yes. It can be speculative, but they need to see the end game. Yep, that's going to be the huge level and the pressure is going to mount. That's yeah. Lou Pugliarisi. You know, we, we really we really have to uh, get together in a room, Lou. Unfortunately, uh, that probably wouldn't be permitted by the distancing rules, but we can we can always talk on Zoom or on the phone. Lou Pugliarisi, the president of EPRIC. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Aloha. Talk soon. Bye-bye. 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 B